So the Battle of Endor was one of the most important battles of the Galactic Civil War. It saw the Emperor's death and the beginning of the final downfall of the Galactic Empire. And both factions involved in the battle knew how important it was and brought very significant fleets to this engagement. Today we'll take a look at some of the ships involved in the battle and the roles they played. I'm Colin, and this is Sci-Fi Deep Dive. Remember, if you enjoyed this video, to head down below and hit that subscribe button. So it shouldn't surprise anybody that the Battle of Endor was a very important battle, and both factions knew this going into it. The Rebel Alliance had spent weeks staging smaller attacks across the galaxy in an attempt to lure Imperial forces away from Endor, and the Empire had known that the Rebels were planning an attack on the battle station, and prepared a fairly large fleet to meet them during this engagement. Today, I figured we'll take a look at the ships that each faction brought to this very important battle. Let's start with the Rebel Alliance, since they have a far more varied and unique fleet. And we'll start with the largest ships the Rebel Alliance brought to the battle, the MC-80 Mon Calamari Cruisers. Now, there were 15 Mon Calamari Cruisers in the Rebel fleet that arrived at Endor, and of that 15, five were of the Liberty subclass, and eight of them were MC-80As like the famous Home One. We know in the Liberty subclass there was obviously the Liberty, which was destroyed by the Death Star's super laser, and we know the MC-80As included obviously the Home One, the flagship of the Rebel fleet. It was from the bridge of the Home One that Admiral Akbar commanded Rebel forces during the battle, but that class would also include the Defiance, the Independence, and the Nautilin. The Nautilin was, by the way, destroyed by the Death Star super laser like the Liberty. With the exception of the Home One, outside of the battle, we really don't know much about the histories of these vessels, but we do know the roles they played during the battle, and many of them served as command ships during the engagement. But while the Mon Calamari cruisers may have been some of the largest and most powerful vessels the Rebels brought to the fight, they were by no means the only vessels the Rebel Alliance brought. The Alliance also had six Nebulon Bs with this battle group. That includes the Redemption. The Redemption is the Nebulon B that serves as the medical frigate where Luke received his robotic arm following the engagement at Cloud City. On top of that, the Rebel fleet also included 16 GR-75 transports. What role these transports served during the battle is still up for debate, although I've heard some suggestions that they were maybe just target saturation. Basically, something else for the Empire to shoot at instead of the larger, more useful vessels. We also know that there were at least 8 CR-90 corvettes, which likely served the role of screening against Imperial starfighters and protecting larger vessels. Four Brachtok gunships, which probably served a very similar role. And four DP-20 frigates, which were smaller vessels that we see very rarely used by the Rebel Alliance, but they were still present in the Rebel fleet during the battle. But capital ships weren't the only things the Rebels were bringing to this fight. They brought a large number of starfighters and small vessels as well. These included a few very notable vessels. Vessels many of us are familiar with, like the Millennium Falcon or the Ghost. And on top of those, there were obviously a large number of starfighters and other small ships as well. We know the Rebels had an undetermined amount of X-4 gunships. They obviously brought a large number of X-Wings, Y-Wings, U-Wings, B-Wings, and A-Wings, as well as a few other very specific vessels, like a second captured Imperial shuttle, not Shuttle Tidarium that was used to land on the planet, but a secondary one, as well as at least one YT-2400 light freighter. But that's what the Rebel Alliance could muster bringing to the battle. The Galactic Empire had to muster an equally large force to counter them. The Imperial force was headed by the Executor, an Executor-class Star Destroyer and the lead ship of its class. This massive dreadnought was incredibly imposing and could have probably taken on this entire Rebel fleet on its own, had it not been destroyed when its bridge was taken out and it collided with the Death Star. But on top of the Executor, the Imperials brought quite the fleet, including at least one battlecruiser, some 30 Imperial-class Star Destroyers, which included many Star Destroyers that we've seen before. Star Destroyers like the Annihilator, the Devastator, and the Eviscerator, which have all played roles somewhere else in Star Wars. We also know there was at least one Tector-class Star Destroyer, which is basically an Imperial class without the hangar. There were likely several interdictor cruisers, which would have obviously played the role in keeping rebel forces there and preventing them from retreating. And of course, we know that there was at least one raider class corvette there, the Corvus, which would be the main vessel we see in Battlefront 2. And like the Rebel Alliance, the Imperials brought a large number of starfighters. Each of these Imperial class star destroyers could carry 72 TIE fighters of various variants. This meant countless TIE bombers, TIE interceptors, and standard TIE fighters were involved in the engagement as well. That's not even counting the largest asset that the Empire brought to this battle, the second Death Star, which was actually larger than the first. Not only was the second Death Star a very powerful weapons platform capable of destroying rebel capital ships in a single shot, but it was also a platform for a significant number of TIE fighters and smaller craft. However, while the Imperials did clearly have a numbers advantage bringing more capital ships and more fighters to the engagement, it all kind of fell apart when their leadership structure dissolved. In the chaos following the destruction of the second Death Star, the Imperial forces retreated from the system not really knowing what to do or who was in charge. 
And while we do see the Battle of Endor prominently in many different fictions, it's actually depicted fairly differently in between Legends and Canon. If you'd like to hear more about some of the ways the Battle of Endor is depicted, I'll leave a link up here to my video on some of the differences between the way it's depicted in Legends and Canon, particularly talking about Battlefront 2. And I want you to let me know down in the comments if there are any of these ships that you would love to hear more of the story behind. Is there anything that was involved in this battle that you'd like to learn more about? I kind of want to talk about the Battle of Endor, so if you have any questions or anything, leave them down below. And last but not least, if you enjoyed this video, head down below, hit the like button, the subscribe button, and the bell icon so you get notified when I upload new videos. So for Sci-Fi Deep Dive, I'm Colin, and I will see you next time.